Great. Well, look, thank you to all of our witnesses. You've all been asked to provide evidence to this inquiry for the APPG for Social Integration because of your varied roles and experience in this policy area. We as an APPG uh, often hold inquiries that look into what some of those barriers might be between different communities and different demographics in society with a view to bringing everybody that bit closer together. We put our work programme to one side to look more closely at the outbreak of the coronavirus into what some of those challenges might be reaching out to some of those more socially isolated and vulnerable groups and demographics over the course of this crisis. We are putting together a report that will initially provide some good ideas and best practice around reaching out to those groups but we will then take our time to look into this in a bit more detail and really get under the skin of what's working, what's not and what are our lessons for the future about making sure we are engaging with all those different groups in our different respective uh, fields. We have with us this morning, um, we have got Robin Tudnam, Chief Exec of Calderdale Council. Welcome, Robin. We will hopefully have Naomi Phillips with us shortly, who's the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the British Red Cross. We've got Sion Andy Hickman, Head of Impact at Football Beyond Borders, but also with a, a real variety of work across uh, youth engagement and youth initiatives. And we've got Catherine Anderson, the Chief Exec of the Joe Cox Foundation. I'm also joined by Peter Gibson. Good morning. Hello, uh, MP for Darlington. We're expecting Jill Furness, who's one of the Sheffield MPs, to be joining us shortly. And we've also got staff from British Future who provide the secretariat to uh, the APPG. If you just want to introduce yourself, so Lucy. Sorry. Hiya. We've got Jake. Hi everyone. We've got Sunder Katwala. Hi. Jill Rutter. Hi. <laughs> and then we've got Steve with us as well, who does comms for British Future. Morning. Great, so I think that's everybody. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to just do your initial uh, five minute overviews, uh, your contributions. Um, we're going to start with Robin. Um, Robin can only join us until 11.45, so just for the other witnesses, we are going to come to Robin with our questions after we've heard our contributions from everybody else so that we can release him and then we'll come back to our witnesses with our questions as well if that's okay. So Robin, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I know how busy you are. Thank you, Chair. Um, what I'll try and do in five minutes is go through the response and the challenges of this pandemic for our communities and the social isolation issues as Chief Executive of Coldwell Council, but also I'm the Chair of the West Yorkshire Local Resilience Forum. So some reflections on West Yorkshire as well. Clearly a pand pandemic of this scale is going to test us and World Health Organization have said that no country's ever dealt perfectly with this plan. So I've, this kind of impact of a pandemic at this scale. So I will be putting in some challenges, but I think in the context that partners at a local level have worked happily, government has had extreme strain and pressure across all parts of government and all departments. Uh, and there are some inevitable challenges, but I think also some things that in place are really difficult for us in kind of dealing with this. So. Just in Calderdale, we very early on, well, uh, relatively early on when we saw the scale of this in March, early March, launched a 10-point plan. Uh, there are two elements to that I think are really important to today. One is that we were, uh, one of the first things is about tackling those that are deemed clinically vulnerable, um, as defined nationally, and recognising that those individuals most at risk from contracting the virus. But we also, right from the beginning, were really clear about wider vulnerabilities and risks and um, they are multiple and wide-ranging people with disabilities, mental health issues, the homeless, asylum seekers, and unfortunately, as we are now seeing, those at risk of domestic abuse and other forms of isolation and vulnerability. So we started from that as a beginning point rather than it becoming something we went on later, building on our vision around kindness and resilience. And I think the single thing I'd say really, really strongly is our existing relationships, that trust your existing relationships, build from those. This is done at pace. We have a vibrant voluntary and community sector, people at Halifax Opportunities Trust, well-established, rooted in communities, 
with intelligence and knowledge of vulnerability in, 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 and across all of Calderdale. And that's true across West Yorkshire. So I think I'm just going to go through what I think is the key issues have been, and then maybe a couple of areas of best practice that I think we've done, not just in, in Coldwell, but West Yorkshire. So the single, probably the biggest, biggest problem has been coordination of uh, a response from government that has been kind of quite fragmented on this. So MHCLG have led with this uh, issue around the shielding and the clinically vulnerable. We had guidance on that. And we, we were quite clear at the beginning that we would work with those communities, but not exclusively. Um, in, in Calderdale, that's about, and, we, and I'll come on to data, that's about 3,800 people, about 41,000 in West Yorkshire that meet that definition. But we know that that's only a proportion of those that are vulnerable. The, 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 the issue around the NHS volunteers, of course, we welcome all volunteers, but we, that happened at a point without any knowledge of, uh, from us in local government, I don't think in MCLG from what I can see, um, that then led to a lot of people going into that as a support and three weeks on that's not really kind of taking much effect. So that's been a real challenge and we've had a lot of kickback from people wanting to help and um, that's been a challenge. So we've got around 750 volunteers that we're, we're, we're putting through five hubs across our borough working with excellent support from the NHS at a local level, uh, primary care networks and GPs. And there's been a real issue, I think, about people's access to health support that's non-COVID related. And that model is, is trying, to, trying to deal with some of those risks. So collaboration and coordination at the centre, often responses coming, um, very high profile responses, then some silence, then some guidance that's maybe not connected into other things. And that's been a real strain not just for the council, but our voluntary community sector locally. Other things um, have been an issue with delivery. Um, so I think local organisations and partners, local government and all, are best placed to deliver in place. They know the place. So the food scheme has been challenging. It's now up and running fairly well uh, through the wholesalers, through two wholesalers to those at risk. Um, we had an emergency drop though, um, which turned out to be 30, 36 parcels we already had 210 people asking for those at that point. So there has been a thing around expectation and reality around delivery, particularly around the food. Cultural needs haven't been addressed, I'm afraid. Uh, and that's been something that we've been raising nationally for several weeks. So that's been an issue about, about uh, cultural needs and diet. The, probably the, the other big one is data, trust and collaboration. So we've put in a, quite a difficult position in local authorities where NHS wrote to the clinically vulnerable. We weren't um, able to get the data. They were contacting us for help. Many of them known to our social care systems. And so we were unable to triage and respond. It took us two weeks. And MHCLG actually very supportive of actually of this. But two weeks within Whitehall to get that data. It's now coming in tranches. We get a different version to the NHS and we're told we're not allowed to see it. The NHS data. And that means that we are expending huge effort in trying to data cleanse, not duplicate and collaborate, where locally we have those relationships and it's working really well. So that's been a significant challenge. Other key issues is food poverty and marginalization. Those that are most vulnerable are, are vulnerable now. We're missing uh, and we're doing a lot of work around that. And, and there's been some great work around those that are homeless, rough sleepers. Um, those in rural areas, I think the real point of rurality and isolation is emerging uh, across West Yorkshire. Um, the other, the other issues are fragility of the voluntary sector. I'm sure others will cover that, um, and the growing concerns around our Black and Asian minority communities, and whether uh, they are accessing services, whether they are supporting each other, particularly our South Asian communities in West Yorkshire, not seeing this call for support um, that we'd expect. Just, just moving on to best practice. That leads me into best practice. I mean, that's all the challenges, some of which have been extremely demanding and be frank quite exasperating but on to some more positive things um, the fire service I just want to call out for being absolutely amazing in West Yorkshire and I know we're not unique in that they have offered and worked with us through the agreement they now have with their trade unions to redeploy firefighters to visit those that we are potentially concerned about that haven't proactively sought contact with us visiting people welfare calls working with our wardens and working with our volunteers but just the credibility and presence of firefighters. Um, clearly people that are known and trusted has been wonderful. So that's been brilliant. 
and their their can do attitude has been amazing we've because of our concerns about reaching those most vulnerable we've done a leaflet drop to every household in the borough which is working its way through um, just being clear about the services just so we don't necessarily go once to people who, who and we're getting people quite confused about the letters uh, I say they're quite frightened about the letter if they're getting it and they're also frightened if they're not getting the letter if they feel they're vulnerable um, so um, links to primary care I've mentioned the role of community foundations has been wonderful our Coldwell Community Foundation have been fundraising some of that isn't necessarily as coordinated as it could be but it's been really important uh, and we've created a dedicated lead politician in our cabinet to lead on the volunteer coordination and social isolation issues. We feel it's so important as one of the core elements of our 10 point plan. And I think giving that political leadership at a local level has been really important. The final thing is obviously, you know, Chair, that we went straight from flooding to this. Um, that's been a real challenge, but also never, ne never miss the crisis opportunity point that whilst hubs are clearly not working in the same way in this pandemic as they did in terms of face-to-face -face contact, the models and the resilience of our voluntary sector has been something that's helped us actually in some ways whilst being a challenge. I think the final thing I'll just say is that I think don't underestimate how frightened people are. Um, it's a wider point about social isolation that we have a, an intensive and critical care unit that's under extreme pressure. We have hospitals that are less occupied than ever known ever ever since the NHS was created and we are really concerned about wider health issues and vulnerabilities. I know government are aware of that and I think there'll be some strong messages about the NHS is still open. I think that's going to have to be quite sustained and strong messaging. I think it's that people are actually frightened to to access primary and, and acute care at the moment and that I know that the compliance has been very high to the messages all for the right reasons but I'd say that's a real issue about vulnerability and isolation at this time. I think that's probably more than five minutes so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Robin. There's an awful lot to unpick there. So we'll hear the other contributions, then we'll come back to you with some questions. Catherine, can I come to you next for your contribution? Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, where to begin on the Joe Cox Foundation? Um, I mean, firstly, I think um, I will just speak about um, what we are doing in particular. I mean, obviously, there are many practical, emotional um, technological issues at play for, for socially isolated groups at the moment. So other organisations and other people on this call will, will speak um, more expertly than I on sort of the practical need. Um, but what we, um, over the last month, really, we've worked extremely fast to respond to um, the question of what we as a foundation can do to he help head off um, a potential crisis of disconnection, really, and looking at the, the country's social and emotional well-being. Um, many people came to us in the early days to ask if we could, um, I suppose, uh, reboot our convening and facilitating role that we played with the Joe Cox um, Commission on Loneliness, which um, obviously has, has come into its own because loneliness has become a, a huge issue right now. And in fact, the polling that we're looking at shows that um, the public's concern around loneliness as an issue has rocketed from about 12 to 15 percent to more like 60 to 65 percent so um that is is clearly something that that's very important um and the other the other thing that i think we are particularly concerned about is how much of an emphasis is being placed on digitizing responses and how tech is coming into its own um which is wonderful but we also know that the most vulnerable people are those who are likely not to have digital capacity and that's something that we want to be aware of so I'll tell you in a minute about what we're doing um, on the convening side and why we are bringing um, tech companies um, in with us but really um, I think to, to go back to the mission of the Joe Cox Foundation and to Joe herself um, Joe identified two truths um, in very different times which are now quite self-evident one is that loneliness and so social isolation does not discriminate um, but its impact is distributed unequally on the most vulnerable. Um, and the second is that we do have more in common than the things that divide us. Um, and those two things combined <clears throat> mean that we have sort of um, taken on that, that role, as I say, to, to think about what we see um, as a potential crisis of disconnection as we exit the acute phase of the um, coronavirus um, <clears throat> at the moment. 
So what, what we've done, um, the main piece of work that we've done is that we have very rapidly um, forged a coalition called the Connection Coalition, which you may have heard about um, after the Secretary of State referenced it last week when he um, wrote in the Times after the charity support package was announced. Um, it's essentially um, very similar to the model of the Joe Cox Loneliness Commission in that we are inviting as many um, organisations um, as, as want to join to, to come together in a very light touch hub, if you like, um, to amplify and coordinate all of the efforts um, in the spectrum of organisations working to tackle social isolation and loneliness um, at any time, but who are particularly coming into their own at this time. Um, we have a group of founding members who have come on board with us to sort of shape the direction of the coalition strategy. Um, the Red Cross um, are there, H HUK, MIND, um, Nesta, um, DCMS are, are backing our work um, in so far as it fits in with the wider civil society effort that DCMS are sort of helping to, to um, coordinate. And um, what we intend to do is achieve impact through um, an immediate, a medium term, term and a longer term um, framework. So immediately we, we want to show that we can follow the requirements of physical distancing without abandoning social connection. Um, we'll do that through gathering content from the members of the coalition around what they're doing to tackle loneliness and social isolation in their community, what's working, what is um, innovative, what is addressing some of those issues I referred to before around digital literacy, um, lack of access to tools, um, and how can we actually scale those up very quickly as part of the response. Um, <clears throat> medium term, we want to show that this... Um, you know, experience, this collective experience that we're seeing of togetherness and solidarity um, is about more than just individual acts of kindness. It shows that the empathy that we're all capable of at, at all times. Um, and in fact, that in the midst of a crisis, there is cause for hope. You know, we're seeing the proliferation of mutual aid groups. We're seeing the amazing response to the NHS, Good Sam app, um, the Red Cross, you know, are, and the, the Royal Voluntary Service are doing so much around... Um, I think aggregating um, that that spirit of volunteerism, volunteerism, um, and what what we think is that those strong social bonds that we're seeing can last beyond corona coronavirus, and that they are a hallmark of of communities at their strongest and at their most um, integrated. Um, and so longer term, we are thinking about how, um, what kind of country do we, do we look like beyond this this acute phase? Um, we can make um, the country a better place. Um, certainly by the way that we respond to each other now, but by showing that that the um, sort of um, cementing of, of communities can last in times uh, not of crisis. And so we, we want to be able to capitalise on that as much as we can. Um, really happy to take questions on the coalition and how practically it's going to operate. Um, we, we, as I say, had our soft launch last week and we already have in excess of 100 organisations who've joined the coalition and that's actually without our, our sort of um, concerted outreach efforts um, having begun. Um, the Joe Cox Foundation is quite unique in that we have a, a very um, national, obviously national reputation. We are a small but very um, influential organisation. We operate from offices in both London and in Joe's constituency in Batley. Um, in Batley, our local team are actually um, a community anchor organisation right now for Kirkley's Council. So this goes back to what Robin said about Calderdale's response. Um, they're one of, of nine uh, sort of mostly voluntary organisations who are acting as a conduit for, for Kirkley's Council to um, help triage requests for support. Um, which means that we're getting a lot of on the ground evidence about what's happening, what's working, what the issues are. Um, loneliness is absolutely a, a huge problem. Um, so there's a lot of work around befriending and matching individuals to um, other community groups who are offering support, particularly around loneliness. Um, but we're also hearing that um, local groups who are reacting um, on the ground and reacting very nimbly and flexibly are, you know, often doing the job that, that, that 
councils can't. Um, now that again is something which we want to be able to harness through the coalition work nationally that we're doing um, so that we can see part of the legacy, part of the positive legacy of this and local authority responses as well is that um, community groups, hyper-local groups, groups that are really connected and connect very um, tangibly to local needs can be empowered to continue that work beyond, as I say, the immediate crisis. Uh, so that's an overview of what we're doing at the moment. And um, I'm conscious I had five minutes to speak. So I hope I've, I've spoken within time and happy to take questions afterwards. Brilliant. And again, thank you for all the great work that, that you're doing, Catherine. Um, can I just welcome Naomi from the British Red Cross? Hi, Naomi, and good morning. Hi there, good morning. Um, because Robin cannot stay with us for the full session, if I come to Sion for your opening contribution, then what we'll do, Naomi, if it's okay, we'll uh, take, we'll put questions to Robin, let him get away, and then we'll come back to you for your contribution, if that's okay, before yeah, we send that's, you to yeah, questions. Fine. Fantastic. Okay, so Sion, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, a lot for having me today. Yeah, so um, I'm Salon Andy Hickman. Uh, I'm the head of impact at the education charity Football Beyond Borders. Um, over the past four weeks, I've led an organisation which usually supports a thousand young people across the country through the crisis. And in some ways, a young person's reason for being on an FBB programme has actually set them up with the challenges only amplified by lockdown. They were on the brink of exclusion from school often due to underlying trauma, a history of childhood, uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, or an inability to engage with the school curriculum, or all of those things. Um, and they love football. And so the two primary conditions of our programme, and kind of the cornerstones of the young people's lives, school and football, are two of the many privileges which we all know COVID uh, has taken away. Um, I don't often like to describe young people as vulnerable um, uh, or, or socially isolated, but it's difficult not to apply those terms right now to many of the young people which FBB support. In order to transform our intensive and, and deeply embedded relationships-based program into something which could exist in the new world order, we've been guided by three principles. Um, firstly, avoid assumptions. Secondly, be flexible. And thirdly, to Robin's point, um, continue to place relationships at the heart of everything. Um, at first, we found ourselves trying to come up with an approach based on a set of assumptions about our young people's lives from the old world. For example, our most at-risk students, uh, who are at the heart of every decision that we make around our programme design. Usually, these students are characterised by their high number of behaviour points and history of school exclusions. Um, and we assumed that they'd be the ones who were struggling the most in isolation and therefore should guide all of our decisions about what we do in the new world. We've learnt quickly that these old assumptions might not hold true now, um, and we did this by listening. So I spoke to young people from Brixton to Burnley to understand exactly what challenges they were facing, the support that they needed, and how we at FBB could attempt to provide that. Across the board, uh, young people told us they were struggling with a lack of structure and routine, with boys waking up at 5pm in the afternoon after playing PS4 till 8am. Little to no support accessing the work their teachers had set them. Loneliness and isolation from their friends and the adults who usually support them, and the inability to deal with their emotions constructively. One of those people was Shaluka, uh, a 14 year old girl from Croydon whose mum's a key worker. When I asked her what she was finding challenging about this period, she told me, and I quote, uh, everything's changed. I feel like I'm walking into my future with a blindfold on. We need the teachers and other adults to support us with schoolwork and our lives. If you're not getting that support at home usually, you look for it in school. When you don't have school, you feel like you're unwanted. I feel alone. My mum doesn't understand how I feel and with work, it's difficult for her to give me the attention that I need. Shaluk is just one of the thousands of 14-year-olds struggling right now with the pressures that come with lockdown, keeping up with their schoolwork and managing their emotions. She's also someone who's identified as a role model usually on our program in the old world. Shaluk's experience illustrated to us that the assumptions and categorizations from the old world might not hold true in the new. Many other young people we work with confirm that. Many of our most at-risk students have told us how much more productive they're being at home without fragmented teacher relationships and uncomfortable classroom environments to hold them back. We've learned that our old assumptions needed to be challenged and that our new assumptions need to be attested. As an organisation who aims to support young people to achieve their English and Maths GCSE and develop the social and emotional skills necessary for a successful transition to adulthood, we've now set ourselves the mission of reaching every young person every day during lockdown. To do this, we've had to listen attentively, move quickly and flex accordingly. 
We've designed a new theory of change in five days and trained practitioners to deliver a virtual school day to provide structure, routine, support for schoolwork and opportunities to interact with their friends. Built into that virtual school timetable is our Instagram platform, where we've been running live wellbeing activities twice a day for young people to join, whilst also creating a separate account for young people to reach out directly if they need to talk. Our therapeutic practitioners have had to be a lot more flexible about when, how and why they engage with the young people. One of our therapists has delivered sessions via Google Hangouts, via Instagram and via Mums Mobile. He's had to deliver sessions to a boy in a supermarket queue and to another in a room with four siblings because there was no other space in the house. We're facing new challenges every day with reaching and supporting our young people. Those without Wi-Fi, mobile data or devices are currently prohibited from accessing vital sources of support. To try and combat this, we're trying to identify all of those with access, making a log and hoping to work with organisations like the Good Law Project to provide laptops and internet. We also work with a family whose mother travelled to Nigeria before restrictions were put in place and she's now stuck there. So we've liaised with, liaised with social workers and yacht workers to ensure contacts are kept and that food support is provided via local authorities. Just like always, relationships remain the key to supporting socially isolated young people. Our new approach is founded on the existing relationships with a teacher who's struggling to get young people to respond to emails, the key worker parent who stretched beyond belief, and of course, the young person themselves who needs a consistent adult in their life now more than ever. The methods might be different in the new world, but the same principles apply when it comes to building and maintaining those relationships. We're trying to avoid assumptions and judgment, listen attentively and flex to meet the young people where they are. We're trying to attune to what they need and using our assets as best as we can to provide it. And I think crucially, the most important point we've learned throughout this is to learn and adapt as quickly as we can. Thanks for having me this morning. I'm happy to take any questions as well. Thank you so much. Uh, some really powerful stuff that you were able to share with us there. So we'll certainly be coming back to you for some questions shortly. Um, but just as I outlined, um, we will be coming to you, Robin, to ask some questions before you have to go, if that's okay at this point. Can I also just welcome Jill Furness, MP, who's been able to join us this morning. Welcome, Jill. Robin, if I could kick us off, I was struck by... Um, your indication that we were concerned that some of our diaspora communities uh, were not perhaps reaching out for support and to access some of that support that's available in the way that some of our other demographics were. Do you think that there are particular reasons for that and what could we be doing to make sure that we're sort of overcoming some of those challenges? Yeah, I think there's a whole range of, of issues there. I, I mean, I, I think we are, we are reaching out to the, to our communities. I think there's a, set of, of organizations in place and i think the, the trust and recognition of of those organizations that know communities that are embedded and have those connections is key so i think we, we're, we're working with with those organizations critically i think there's some of the issues that other colleagues have raised around access around some of the concerns actually about and it, this is beyond just diaspora communities but others around um, the role of the state and the anxiety around access uh, and support at this time uh, and and people fear and people working within families and within close communities and faith communities and we've worked closely with faith communities of all faiths on this so i i think i think the other the other element to that is really about our our work with our primary care services who can often be really embedded in place and know communities well uh, and i think there's the challenge i think i went back to the point about the message about almost um you know, don't, it was, isn't intended, there's been, a, it's been heard as um, the NHS is, is fully occupied, um, public services are fully occupied, um, you know, stay at home, and the stay at home is obviously the right message, but if you just took, take that purely literally, and I think the point Solange raised about young people, uh, there's, there's an accumulation of impact there, and I think with, with young, and actually young people across all our communities, we are starting to see the signs of strain. And I know there's been worry separately about young people being missing from systems, um, a massive reduction in nationally, and it's locally true as well, in referrals into some of our frontline services like children's social care. Uh, and is that right? Is that, is it, where, where's, where's that going? So I think true of diaspora communities, but also many other communities at risk and, and, and being vulnerable, I think. And is there a particular issue, Robin, through local authorities about those who've got no recourse to public funds as part of their migration status, that there is very much a message there usually to that particular group that you are, you are not able to access this support. It's not there for you. We've really got to find ways of overcoming that. Have you been informed that there's any relaxation of that 
to local authorities from central government? Uh, no, there isn't. Yes, I've been in those conversations as a union chair. I've got a regional role around asylum, asylum seekers and migration. Uh, and um, I've been in dialogue with the Home Office, with other regional lead chief executives on a range of issues. Uh, the Home Office have kind of worked quite hard, I think, to suspend some of their current practices around and they need to move people out of accommodation during the pandemic. Uh, we are working to support that because clearly that's increasing in that numbers of people that we are needing to accommodate and support. We are working hard to make sure that, that people get health care in particular and social connection as well. Uh, the, the simple answer on that though is no, we've asked and we've asked repeatedly that that could be um, suspended at the moment and that we can support those communities. And, and, and as you'll know, there are some local organisations and we work in ways to try and kind of meet that gap with individuals because there are people in, in, mm. in state of destitution that we just have to do that. We, we are doing it. Okay, thank you. Peter, I know you had a question for Robin. By your use of the word trust, and uh, I think it follows through some of the other things that the, the other... Um, evidence givers have mentioned. Um, looking to the future and building on this afterwards, um, I'm particularly concerned that we, we learn the lessons from this uh, scenario that we're going through at the moment. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that building trust. And I was particularly taken with your mention and uh, reassurance that the involvement of the fire brigade has actually given in the community. Um, could you also um, give us a little bit of illumination about the level of participation and volunteering uh, from the black and uh, ethnic minority communities and whether there's something for us to learn about um, accessing that community, dealing with that level of isolation in that community and whether they're actually getting involved in the volunteering as well. Uh, and then if you could also please just tell me um, what, because uh, I was particularly impressed by what you were saying your local resilience forum is doing, um, what is happening in terms of sharing that um, good practice knowledge that you've got with other LRFs around the country and is there a forum where you're sharing that best practice? Because wh whilst we're in the middle of this crisis it would be great if that best practice is being shared almost on a daily basis so that those other, other LRFs can learn the lessons that others are learning and the mistakes that they're making so that we're improving all the time throughout the crisis rather than us having a lovely wash up afterwards and saying, wouldn't it have been nice if? Sorry, the, there's three questions there, Robin, apologies. That's fine, they're really good questions, thank you. So on trust, um, it may be a bit utopian or opt over optimistic, but wouldn't it be a legacy of this that we began to think about public services rather than organisational silos? Uh, I think that the fire service response is, is typical of that. I think that the way that people experience services isn't, isn't segregated in the way that organisations do it, sometimes locally and, and, and often nationally. So I think that there is trust and relationships that have built across agencies in crisis. Uh, and I think we've had this from the flooding. So how can we how can we have the moment of crisis in a more sustained way? Let's not forget those those relationships that are now been forged. Uh, and I think that's been you see who comes forward and who steps forward at this time. And I think that's really important. I think the the data point around trust has been the biggest challenge. I think that uh, we we can we can manage data. Um, you know, so I think there's understandable concerns around confidentiality and GDPR. But actually, uh, social uh, social care is dealing with incredibly sensitive data as such as much as um, GPs on a daily basis. So, a trust and a real um, delivery of shared information, reduction in duplication, would not only mean we could do things more efficiently, but actually our citizens would get a better service because they weren't going to fragmented health and social care providers. So that's one point. On, the, um, on our Black and Asian minority communities and volunteering, yes, um, there's been an incredible response. Our faith communities were, uh, and, but also our young, some of our young people's groups. We've got an organization called HIMAT that's, that works in, in our park ward, which is our most diverse uh, part of Halifax. We've seen that across all West Yorkshire authorities. 
and we've got a voluntary sector group which is learning from each other and I think one thing this has done is that uh, voluntary sector organisations are talking to each other more and sometimes probably sometimes our fault that the commissioning arrangement sometimes puts them in a competitive space and we are now seeing more collaboration and sharing so yes that's true I think also to talk about our workforce our workforce that is not still as diverse as our communities but has I think improved hugely in the last 12 months and our workforce, 80% of our staff live and work in Calderdale and they have volunteered. They've been redeployed. We have leisure staff that can't um, work in the leisure centre because it's closed, working in our homeless shelter uh, and actually supporting homeless people. So, you know, and, and, and clearly we can't compel people. And then there have been some issues with trade union colleagues, but actually we'll work through that to enable people to go into different roles. And actually, I think that people will be in a different future. I, I talk about, I, I, I sort of say, don't talk about return to normality. We need to think about what will the new normality be? How can we reset public services in the future? And then the final point about learning best practice, we do have, um, I think we're probably not doing that as well as we could, partly because the strain of just the daily challenge of just the daily response, we're an emergency response. As we move hopefully to a a more stabilised space we can learn better. We have a national chairs call once a week. We have resilience directors share information. We have returns that we're feeding in that we can all see what everyone else is doing. We have in Yorkshire and Humber a four chair and four LRF call once a week to check in on what we're doing. So we're doing it as a region, but we probably could do that better. But I think it, we're running to catch up a bit at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And I think uh, I'm mindful that you've got an awful lot on, so we're going to release you at this point. But thank you very much for that really important contribution that you've made this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Naomi, in that case, can I come to you for your opening contribution from the British Red Cross? And thank you very much for joining us this morning. It is very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the British Red Cross. Um, uh, and um, the, as you may know, the British Red Cross is the largest voluntary and community sector emergency response organisation uh, in the UK. And today we're mobilising thousands of emergency response volunteers to deliver food, medicines and more. Um, to vulnerable people in their communities during this crisis. We're also working in hundreds of hospitals up and down the country um, to support people and our NHS. And we are the largest independent provider of refugee and asylum support services across the UK, supporting tens of thousands of people um, each year. And we've also invested a lot in community connector schemes, which are effectively a form of social prescribing to tackle loneliness and help isolated people build social connections. Um, meaningful connections, as we all know, are absolutely critical to individual and community resilience. For people on the margins, vulnerable uh, or with complex needs, the current crisis could well exacerbate their ability to connect with others and to the services that they so urgently need. So, but there are, all, are also opportunities to take hold of. So I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on loneliness, drawing from our own experience um, and research, um, people who are vulnerable, and our particular concerns about the impact of the emergency on refugees and people seeking asylum. Um, starting with loneliness, it was already one of the greatest public health issues um, and really risked becoming more so now. Our research found that before the coronavirus emergency, one in five people across the UK were always or often lonely. And previous Red Cross polling also found that millions of people across the UK felt that they have no one to rely on or turn to in a crisis. And too many felt that no one would even notice if something bad was happening to them. And we know from our other research, focusing on people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, that there can be particular barriers for people to building connections and accessing services as well. And many of the people that the Red Cross supports are in this position. We are especially concerned about the people who are already lonely, disconnected and isolated. And while social isolation is distinct from loneliness and not always negative, um, prolonged and unwanted isolation is really not good for us. And so we really are concerned about the impact of this crisis. It's really important that we do, do our best to protect ourselves and those around us, such as reaching out to family or friends, offering to do the shopping for a neighbour who might not be able to. Those small acts of kindness genuinely can make all the difference. 
and the cross-government approach to tackling loneliness, which we've been working very closely with government and partners from across the sector, from across sectors on loneliness over the past uh, few years. Um, the cross-government approach really has never been more important and we'd really like to see more dedicated resource backed up by clear plan plans and new policies now and in the aftermath of the crisis as well. And to help to take the agenda to the next phase, throughout 2020, the all-party parliamentary group on loneliness, which the British Red Cross uh, and the COP supports, is running a major independent inquiry into loneliness. We've also been convening stakeholders uh, in the loneliness space, uh, including recently a very popular Twitter chat uh, on the impact of COVID-19, which focused on understanding what practical steps people and organisations are taking now to help to maintain social connections for people who are isolated and vulnerable. And we've found that many have already flexed their models so that they can continue to support people with loneliness. But as Catherine alluded to, actually, um, much of the, that support is online, yet many older people, for example, aren't digitally literate, uh, and a huge fraction of the population are really at risk of digital isolation. So, for example, we think that GCMS could play an important role in rapidly developing and funding new initiatives to support people who are digitally isolated. But digital and physical isolation isn't only an issue for older people, of course, and it's affecting many of the people that we support, including through our refugee services too. And there, on, on, for those people, there are two main issues that are really compounding this. So one is around charities having to adapt and restrict the support they're providing, particularly because of financial pressures. Um, and the second is the ability for the asylum system, which improves at a glacially slow pace uh, anyway, but to adapt uh, to COVID-19 as well. Um, and refugees and people seeking asylum are a prime example of a hidden population who are particularly vulnerable in the current context. So along with others in the sector, and we've been really proud to work in coalition with others from across the refugee and asylum sector, we've been advocating for a series of changes to the operation of the asylum process, and have seen some welcome and vital changes, including the temporary ending of eviction asylum accommodation, which we estimate could protect up to 50,000 people uh, from the fear of homelessness and uncertainty. The ending of the requirement to travel to Liverpool to make further submission on a, an asylum claim, and the suspension of reporting requirements, which really will help to remove the fear of detention for those who need to self-isolate and wouldn't be able to physically go to report. But we, there are a number of changes that still need to happen. Um, for example, increasing the financial support that people seeking asylum get, at least to match um, at least to match universal credit, making sure that asylum accommodation is actually suitable and allows people to safely comply with social distancing and, self, and to self-isolate if necessary. For many people, that's a really big issue that they're not able to self-isolate. And suspending healthcare charging and data sharing between NHS and home office because we think that's actually potentially putting people off um, accessing really important health needs at the moment. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on what we're what else we're doing to ensure more people's needs are met in the best possible way. So we're working with our partners in the voluntary and community sector emergencies partnership on mapping unmet need and vulnerabilities. And we're putting together data and information on hidden populations and needs which are not yet being met for people who may not be on official registers in data, for example. Um, and we're helping to link to, with our partners, we're helping to link national and local to local delivery and to volunteering. Um, and that real link between the national and the local and getting things out to the people who need it is gonna be really, really critical to success. And we want to work with government at all levels to drive forward and implement a genuinely human-centered approach uh, that will help to keep people connected. Um, and we know that connected communities are more able to prepare effectively from crisis and to recover better afterwards. But still, far too many people are isolated from others, leaving them vulnerable when emergencies occur. That was the case before coronavirus, and the situation is much more acute now. Thank you very much for that important uh, and, again, insightful contribution, Naomi. Um, perhaps then opening it up to questions, and if I can put a question to all three of our witnesses um, for your thoughts on this. Just turning to digital exclusion, because so many of the areas and ways that we need to provide support to people have moved online and are being provided digitally. There will be challenges where perhaps uh, older people don't have that technology, but perhaps then younger people. Are we, uh, are we sure that all young people have access, access to that technology, but also are we sure that they're able to access that in a safe way? Unfortunately, we are seeing police forces anticipating an increase in um, grooming, whether that's sexual grooming or criminal grooming, 
perhaps through online methods and for older people perhaps we're anticipating an increase in scams who are targeting those older people so where we are encouraging those to use technology are we satisfied that people have access to technology i don't think we are but also are we satisfied that people are able to use technology safely and is that causing those anxieties and how are we overcoming some of those challenges so perhaps Ceylon if I come to you first with the with your perspective from a young people's angle yeah absolutely so um I guess on on the access question um definitely not I think there's a, it's a big assumption that young people are more digitally connected than older people and yes um, they're often savvier with the technology um but we're actually finding that we we're using um kind of adult ways of zoom or google hangouts things like that to to connect with young people and that that is a foreign thing to them doing doing a video call so about how how we adapt those processes but also um ensure that we keep young people safe at the same time and um, one thing uh, on access is is some um families that i've spoken with um are they don't have wi-fi uh, in the house or um and they're all using mobile data and usually kind of the mobile data usage has been okay but when everyone's at home um, and all we have to do or the families have to do is, is go on their phones and access digital support and things like streaming and things like uh, digital phone calls like this um, obviously take up quite a lot of mobile data and um, we've got young we've got families um, yeah living in poverty who uh, do not have enough data and can I've spoken with a, a vulnerable young person who um, it's 13 years old and uh, she's jumped on a call for about 20 seconds and she said that's all I've got I've got to go now and we've run an hour session um, and she's therefore missing out on the relationship with her peers and um, the learning that we're delivering in those sessions the support we're offering with our homework because she has no wi-fi at her dad's house and um, she doesn't want to use up all of her data so um, we are trying to investigate and probably um, would would very much welcome support um, in terms of bursaries for young people to access and buy bundles of, of mobile data and, um, and, and identifying where that need is. Um, in terms of safeguarding um, for young people um, online, a big thing we've been doing a lot of uh, research into and um, I think on the point around grooming um, and the, vulnerable, the uh, young people being exposed um, to that as an addition, additional risk that they may not have been subjected to as much. Um, I'd go back to uh, the importance of relationships and trusted adults and connection in their lives that um, they can connect to whoever that person is, whether it's the youth worker, whether it's a teacher, um, it may be a source of shame that they, they can't speak about in their, in their family home to their parents. So um, ensuring that those organizations that have those responsibilities and relationships with young people um, who can provide support um, and signposting um, and you know, get the authorities involved when, when necessary, um, that, that we're able to connect those young people to those, those sources of support. Great, thank you. And Catherine, can I come to you next? Um, yes, yeah, sure. I think, um, yes, I mean, it, it, it's one of these things which COVID has, um, I suppose, aired is the um, divide between digital haves and digital have-nots. Um, and I guess you could argue that that is less important than, you know, the immediate needs of food and shelter and, and um medication and, and that kind of thing but I, I think it's playing out in different ways I mean for example um, access to homeschooling um, tools and resources you need to have good broadband and you need to be online and you need to be digitally literate so there's obviously a kind of homeschooling gap playing out there and I think these things will all become very evident um, to the point that Ceylon made about um, data and access. I, I believe that the government has been talking to telecom companies just in the last couple of days about lifting data caps, um, deferring bills, um, introducing very rapidly um, low cost packages. I think that's something that really needs to be um, addressed and if possible pressure applied to, to make those things happen. Um, but I think, you know, as far as positive legacies of COVID go, um, the, the, the fact that broadband really is the fifth utility, I think it's referred to as the fifth utility, maybe the sixth utility, but it is a, it is a right to have access to good broadband and to the, the knowledge that, that we get. Um, and with that right comes a responsibility from government and um, civil society to make sure that people are, have those literacy skills. So um, 
it's it's pretty early days, as I say, but I think what we, we need, we will understand with greater clarity at the end of this is that digital literacy really matters. When you're stuck at home and you're shielding or you're self-isolating, getting online is a lifeline for people. Um, so I would love um, for part of the work that, that we're doing with the Connection Coalition to, to be really addressing that. And the involvement with Nesta is, is very key here because they've obviously been running with DCMS um, a tech, tech to Connect challenge, which is all around how we can address um, social isolation through tech. Um, it's, it sounds abstract and modern and for many people who are, um, you know, who do struggle with digital literacy, it all seems a bit sort of, um, sort of, yeah, as I say, abstract and, and, and intangible. I think we have a duty now to make it very tangible. And I think that's really coming through in the current crisis, how important it is. Yeah, and thank you for that. And, and Naomi, I imagine, again, there are some real challenges around some of our migrant communities, perhaps refugees and asylum seekers in particular, having access to technology over the course of this crisis. Yeah, I mean, I, I would sort of echo kind of everything that, that's been said, really. Um, on, on the point of around um, refugees and people seeking asylum, one of the issues that we know uh, is already coming up is that charities for example don't just provide direct services we also often provide space for people so um, some of our services provide space for people to come together to connect with others to do their washing um, but also to, to use our wi-fi um, which actually helps people to connect it's a lifeline for people to connect with um, people here services that they absolutely need in this country but also to connect with their friends their family their loved ones abroad um, and we are um, concerned that without um, for example being out able to access spaces where they can access free Wi-Fi, such as through some of our refugee services, um, that that really is going to um, uh, damage people's ability to, to connect and, and, and maintain those connections, um, which they desperately need both here um, and abroad. So we do think that that is absolutely an issue. Um, and then kind of briefly on the, on the wider points, I mean, we do know that uh, 16 to 24 year olds are most likely to report feeling always or often lonely. So we know that loneliness is a huge issue for younger people. Um, and therefore efforts to try to maintain social connections uh, for young people of any kind of background um, is incredibly important. Um, and I think that those kind of ideas, accepting that many people are not able to access digital information and you know immediately um, is something absolutely to, to, to consider um, and we're really interested in understanding what else we can do so we're, we're at the moment we're doing a rapid piece of research and looking at what some of our community connectors who normally do face-to-face -face connections with people who may be high intensity users of health services uh, right through to elderly people who may not have left their homes for a long time um, actually usually that's face-to-face -face support but we're trying to understand what, what people are doing now to support people and one of our um, wonderful connectors um, Nadia told us recently that actually she's like well look not everyone's on the internet but pretty much everyone has a phone so at the moment just picking up the phone making those calls having that contact doesn't doesn't even need to be very long a couple of minutes a day it's really helping to understand and, and stop people tipping into crisis just making those connections but again we'll be very happy to share when we've got our kind of insight that we're drawing from our wider services and then finally we, we already provide a huge range of um, education resources which uh, are targeted at younger people but are specifically um, around building resilience and at the moment it feels like that's a really really important issue as well about how to help to build and maintain your own emotional uh, resilience so that you can um, you know really kind of find your own practical ways of managing at the moment and actually seeing yourself through this crisis. Yeah great thank you very much for that Naomi. Uh, Jill Furness I know I had a question next. Yeah, if you don't mind, can I apologise for not being here a bit earlier, but I think like all the bizarre days, I'm consumed by these Zoom conference calls, mostly at the moment. Um, so I missed the first speaker, so I can't really, I couldn't really ask anything. But a can I ask something of all three of you that are left? I'll try and be quick, because I know I haven't got much time. Uh, the Joe C Catherine Anderson, I really would, and uh, I'm, I miss quite a lot of what you said, but I would like to get together by Zoom or whatever means will happen in the future to talk about your work because it's something that I'm really interested in. I've just um, very happily been given the new role as Women and Equalities um, Shadow Minister. So a lot of this, I think, I've got a lot of useful ideas, I think, and ways forward. So it, it would be interesting to work with all, all of you in the future. Uh, so, I, I mean, that's what I'm going to say to start with. But I think 
just sort of rounding, rounding up in a way. I think the COVID has definitely shown the disparity in digital skills and digital um, exclusion here. And definitely, I think we should all be working together to actually push that to government that there's got to be a bigger rollout of broadband and that that broadband has got to be affordable for all because it just makes sense to do so, doesn't it? It doesn't seem to you know, it make any sense to do anything else. So that, I think that would be something I would be wanting to look at with all of you. Uh, but if I could just ask a question of Ceylon, um, football, we know always, you know, unites a massive amount of the population. And I think that's great. And you spoke about some women, but I wondered how many women and how many uh, girls or boys, what, you have, like, what, what the proportion is. And also, I've been banging on about, I've been a women's officer at local level and trade union level in the past. And I've always been banging on about, we've got to get more girls off the streets and away from the gangs and football doesn't do it for all of them and I would like people I think to think about other interests that you can you know may seem very girly you know it might be do you want to learn how to do a manicure how do you want to you know beauty pro you know how do you want to be more beautiful or whatever but if that engages young women to me to find their sort of female role models and to get those links with other people and get them talking about why they may be on the edge of criminality. Let's do it. And I've yet to get, I don't find anyone who's taken me up on that offer, but I'd be quite pleased if you have any ideas out there to help me pursue this line because I think, you, you know, you, we don't like to call people vulnerable because they don't like being called vulnerable, do they? But they, you know, as you have said earlier, sometimes that is the only term that we can use. And uh, we do need to reach out, I think, to a section that we miss in, in those teenage years. And I'd also just like to say to Naomi that, that I, you know, I found that quite fascinating, the, uh, particularly the Twitter chat. I'd like to explore that in a bit more detail. And the constituency that I represent is uh, a, a very multicultural. There's 39 languages spoken in one of the wards that I've got, might even be more by now. And it's vital, really, for me to be able to support uh, those refugees, the people who, you know, we quite often help people. We've got a family we've got over from Syria that I'm very proud of. And it's very difficult for them. I understand how difficult it is for them when, you know, they get here. And I would enjoy a conversation probably in the future. Uh, to go through those issues as well. But thank you all for allowing me in today. Celan, do you want to come back and respond to some of Jill's points about, about the, that youth engagement work? Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, I'm really here to share. Uh, it's really good to hear that you share my passions in, in all of the space. Everything I'm kind of speaking to is exactly what, um, yeah, why, why I work for FBB really. Um, but um, yeah, on the, I guess on the women's uh, point in particular, I'd say our, our, um, our philosophy at FPB is about putting young people's passions at the heart of their learning, um, whether that is football or, or something else. So, um, yeah, we, we began uh, actually just working exclusively with boys five years ago um, and they always wanted to work with girls but didn't really have a methodology for doing so. And I kind of came in and, uh, two years ago and, and piloted our first goals programme and, and have grown it since. But it's exactly what you're talking about is having uh, women in their lives that they look up to who affirm their passions, whatever those passions are. And if that's you know, slightly different to football, if it's a girl comes into my classroom and says, I love I love playing Minecraft or and I love watching makeup tutorials. It's about being like, yeah, that's incredible. And I love that. And that's really interesting. And you're important and you matter. And it's about how we use a young person's passions and, uh, and uh, yeah, make them feel wanted and, and that they don't need to look elsewhere for that sort of affirmation that, that you, um, you lent mm -hmm. towards. Um, one of the things I would say in this moment and the difference between girls and boys and that's really struck me and I'd really like to look more at is um, boys uh, that I spoke to in, in these series of focus groups on across our programs across the country were much more socially connected to their friends through gaming. So FIFA and uh, basically playing FIFA um, and until the early hours of the morning live on a headset um, meant that they were connecting with their friends a lot more. Girls didn't have that that. Um, often didn't have consoles in their homes or um, weren't, weren't interested in that. And there was, there was less of an alternative for them. So we spoke to girls who usually have so many friends around them when we see them at schools who were like, oh yeah, I haven't really spoken to my friend. I've had one girl um, who's from a Romanian uh, family in Croydon and I spoke to her about how she's spending her day and she's 
getting up and she's cleaning and um, she's cleaning the house all day with her four siblings. That's all they're doing. Um, and I asked her how she was getting on the schoolwork and she said, I, I spend five minutes trying to sit down and, and have a go at it and I can't do it. And there's no one there to ask for help. And then I just have to go and clean again. So that's, that's a 13 year old girl's reality right now. And that's all she's doing at the moment. And she hasn't got that release, um, you know, overnight to spend on FIFA and, and connect with her friends. And, and that, that's something that really, really struck me is like, what, what is on offer right now? And that's why we're really going for this kind of virtual school day uh, approach where we create those spaces for young people to come together because they're as, as social as young people are, they're not that good at organizing their own social lives. So they're not great if they're 13, 14 years old at creating those spaces. Um, uh, and I think to Naomi's point about charities who provide that space for young people or, or whoever it is to come together. And it's exactly the same thing. They all come into our YouTube and they say, can we get on the Wi-Fi? Um, but at least they're connecting there around each other. So we're seeing it very much as how do we create a digital space that is open to all. Um, we're using our Instagram, as I, as I mentioned, of, of uh, doing well-being activities which are live. Um, and I think called Practitioners Corner where their favorite practitioners jump on an Instagram live and they get to see them and ask them questions and they can feel connected to the other young people across our programs who, who, um, who, yeah, we really try and create a sense of family as an organization. And I think that's something that's really testing us. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're responding to their feedback kind of daily of, well, we're tuning into this, we're not doing this, I can't get on this. So mm. um, that's, I think, been really, really important for us in, in this period. Thank you very much for that. And, and there may be other things that Naomi and Catherine want to contribute mm. there to, to Jill's uh, question, but perhaps Peter, if I come to you, um, yep. and, then, and then we can try and bring all of that together as we get towards the end of the session. Thanks, Holly. Um, there's sort of little questions for um, Naomi, Salon and, and Catherine, um, but they sort of all come together, really. Um, Naomi, can you tell us whether you've seen extra volunteers coming to your organization and can i ask you what your plans are post covid with regards to mobilizing your volunteer force that you have and the knowledge that you gain through this experience in terms of making contact with people who are isolated as a result of this what your plans are as an organization to to feed into your organization doing something about that. Um, Salon, I, I loved your three points. I absolutely love them. And I think we can all learn something from that. Avoid assumptions, be flexible, and relationships are at the heart of everything. Um, that, you know, we, we can all learn something from that. And I think, you know, um, this whole experience that we're all living through, um, those three key things are, are, are absolutely central to our experiences of that. I was also touched by your, um, your expression old world and new world and I wonder if you can just say a little bit for me about that and, and very similar to the point that I've asked of Naomi, um, the, the lessons learned from this experience now, what are you going to do, how is that going to affect how your organisation runs and operates in the future. And then Catherine, in respect of um, the work that you're doing uh, with the Joe Cox Foundation and the Connection Coalition, um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly encouraged by that. And I have just taken a look on, on the website and it's incredible the number of organizations that you've already got coming into that. Um, and I think what I really want to know is what's its longer term future? Um, if you can bring all of those organizations together on the same agenda, dealing with the same issues that we're all facing, all those charities, voluntary bodies, third sector organisations, etc., to mobilise them at this time, what can that organisation do to tackle the isolation agenda, to tackle the issues that it's facing at this time, learning the lessons that it has for the future? Because I think for all of us, there are so many incredible lessons to be learnt in this experience to make our society better and, and I think it's it's key that we learn those lessons as we're going along rather than rushing through it getting beyond it and then forgetting all the lessons that we've learned so lo lots of questions there so apologies for that shall I 
go first. Um, I think there was a lot there. I think I've sort of, um, sort of noted down a few bits, but obviously we will be very happy to provide some written evidence into this inquiry as well, where we can absolutely kind of flesh out and pick up um, some more of those points. Um, I mean, I think in terms of absolutely, we on the volunteering points, we've absolutely seen a big increase in volunteers. So we already have uh, volunteers who support all of our services, um, from refugees through to health for our emergency response, who are who are fully trained, um, and we deploy them as as usual. And now we've recruited. I'm going to say I think it's nearly seventy thousand community reserve volunteers. So this is a light touch volunteering approach that we set up. Um, a, about 18 months or, or two years ago, um, which basically means that anybody can register to become a, a CRV and effectively you'll get a, it's very simple and you get a text on your phone when there's something in your area where you can help with. We're now recruiting, um, we've seen a huge um, upswell in, in people really interested in becoming um, CRVs right across the UK and we're starting to deploy them to support vulnerable people in local areas um, coordinated uh, by our Red Cross team so um it's it's just been this huge incredible kind of groundswell of support that we're seeing right across the country and again in terms of what you know how do we want to maintain these things but i think it's just been incredible and that uh, aside from all the very bad things that we know are happening um actually there are some really good things that we hope that we'll as a country be able to maintain and i think that kind of upswell and voluntary action is one of them um in terms of our, for ourselves, we, we, we pride ourselves on being a learning organisation. Um, we have we invest a lot in, in research into what we're doing, but also into uh, the impact of people on, on policies and support our advocacy work and our influencing. Um, one of the ways that we're working now is in greater partnership with others from across the voluntary and community sector, and that's both at the national level um, and also the local level. And one of the structures that I mentioned was the Voluntary and Community Sectors Emergencies Partnership. That was actually developed from learning from uh, the responses to major emergencies in 2017, the series of terrible terror attacks in London and Manchester and the Grenfell Tower fire, where we were very proud of our response and the volunteers and across the sector, but we also recognized that as a sector, we could be better united we could be better coordinated um, and actually help be targeted in a better way to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people. So we've already, we're already now putting into action some of that learning from major emergencies in the past. And we are really finding, working very hard to find kind of real time solutions to some of the really tricky challenges that we're facing around meeting the needs of very vulnerable people, meeting the needs of people who are more hidden um, from populations, people who've been trafficked, refugees and people seeking asylum. Um, as well as um, other vulnerable people. Um, and these structures that we're putting in place now, working very, very close with central and local government as well, we'll be hoping to see and capitalise on in the future and really embed in the future. And that absolutely links to volunteering. This is not about um, brands or um, kind of siloed working. This is absolutely about working as much as close partnership as possible. We are convening um, a number of forums across the sectors in which we work, and we're also delighted to be part of other coalitions. Um, because actually, if we if we want to meet the needs of the most vulnerable, we have to do that in partnership, and we have to do that together. Um, so, kind of going forward, absolutely building on the new structures, promoting volunteering in fact voluntary action is one of the fundamental principles of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement um, and be in a position to advocate for change and what we don't want to see is a rollback on progress so some of those changes that I mentioned in terms of uh, the, um, the home office um, and the asylum system but actually we, some of those are actually quite positive but we really don't want to see a rollback as well so it's all about really understanding really learning in real time what we're doing now capturing that and using that to inform how we can all work better together in the future. Catherine should we perhaps come to you next? Yes th thanks Peter and um, that's a perfect segue from Naomi because I think what we're seeing as well is a real um, ability to um, abandon egos and work together uh, and recognize that this is not a time to be territorial about anything. Um, I'm seeing that from, you know, in corporates to um, local groups to um, local authorities. So um, to, to answer your question, Peter, I, I know that um, what, what we're doing with the, the Connection Coalition is to begin with quite tricky because it deals with quite a intangible thing which is this idea of why is connection important not necessarily hand-to-hand -hand connection but this idea that we share um we, we have a shared uh, you know we're in a shared moment together and 
um, the act of reaching out to, to one another is something that we can share and that can build stronger, more cohesive communities. Um, what, what we're looking at is some, some initial um, outputs from the Connection Coalition, um, some medium term outcomes, and then I think to your point, the impact, how can we build on what we're doing and ensure that this is not a short lived kind of reaction. Um, the first thing is that through the coalition, we would we would um, provide the ability for um, members to share their approaches and to match them up with um, tech companies and, and other bigger um, sort of corporates and players who can can build capacity so that they can um, scale up the work that they're doing. Um, the second thing is that we think that to counterbalance that issue of abstraction of what is social connection, um, we can actually build a very um, granular narrative. So it's stories around connection. How, how is connection happening um, in the four nations across the country in rural settings, urban settings, you name it, you know, these are um, showing how we are reaching across lines of difference relate, uh, relating to, to the most vulnerable. Um, and we are together shaping a, a shared collective narrative. And the third thing is, you know, adapting um, sort of campaigning assets so that our coalition members can get these messages out to their, to their followings very easily. Um, medium term, it's about membership sharing different approaches, potentially adopting new approaches that others are using, um, acting together to, to strengthen those shared approaches, um, building organizational capacity, confidence, and actually looking at different thematic areas within the um, within the coalition. So we've got mind leading on mental health approaches uh, and why, why connection matters um, to tackle mental health issues. We've got cruise bereavement care, looking at what is going to be an inevitable, um, you know, huge increase in, in grief and bereavement in this country, completely unexpectedly for, for the majority. Um, and if, don't mind, if I can just cut in there, I've been made aware of a couple of incidents where not only are people having to grieve for loved ones that they've lost through the coronavirus, but to potentially have to do that in isolation as well is putting an enormous challenge on some of the support services to be able to reach out to people in that particular position. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is not a normal, uh, things are not normal right now. Um, you're, you would expect to uh, your loved one, you know, at the very least for, for everyone to be able to attend their funeral, you would expect to have con a degree of control over how they're um, you know, their cremation or their burial happens. Um, nothing is normal right now. And that's going to compound what is already a horrible experience for, for anyone who's going through bereavement. Um, so as these different sort of themes of well-being crystallize, I think there's going to be huge um, uh, sort of opportunity to develop resources which take us way beyond the crisis and which really, um, I think, you know, um, will build a lot of depth into the work that the, the coalition's doing. Um, and I think it will also um, sort of inspire us all to come together post-crisis um, to connect more. You know, we're building relationships, we're, we're, we're building relationships that are all, the common thread is that collective shared message of hope. And then I think um, longer term, Peter, I mean, there are some assumptions um, implicit in our approach. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people for whom acts of community connection are brand new behaviors to them. Um, it's not the usual suspects reaching out in their communities. We're seeing people who have probably never got involved in their community um, before getting involved. So it's how can we work in an enabling way to ensure that that, that is recognized and built upon. Um, and I think impact wise, it's about um, really, you know, um, I, I think building on, on the work of the, the Joe Cox um, Loneliness Commission and the, the work that we're seeing at the moment with organizations like the Red Cross and the, the RVS, it's about being able to match um, policy making. And this is always the, you know, the, the best policy I, change I think comes from you know tangible grassroots example we can get straight into to DCMS and MHCLG to organizations to funders to um, you know the thought leaders in and around government to share that activity to share the impacts we're seeing and to strengthen that field of connection I think in the long term and I think we've got brilliant support from DCMS we've got their 
they're taking this very seriously. The Secretary of State's having a roundtable tomorrow morning about about loneliness, and um, and we just need to make sure that that we are stronger than the sum of our parts, and that we we carry that momentum forward. All of that's being developed, but I I am very hopeful that it can happen. Thanks, Catherine. And it always just feels like we're just starting to get under the skin of some of these issues before we have to start to think about winding up. But Ceylon, can I come to you for a response to Peter's question before we start to bring all of this together? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think uh, the, to your first point around the um, old world and new world categories, I think it's been really helpful for us as an organisation to, to talk in that whilst we've been innovating. I think for some of the categories and ways that we worked um, beforehand or kind of hamstringing us in, in operating as quickly as possible as a, as a smaller organisation. So it's been helpful for us to, to ask practitioners and, and, and staff to, to Think, forget about the things in the old world and, and ask them to think about how we how we use our assets in, in kind of this new world and we've a lot of that has been um we ran a very quick design sprint um and now we're looking at rapid cycle testing and learning as quickly as possible each day from whether this is working what impact we're having and i think that's one of the things we definitely um take forward to your second question i think we're obviously in a as a, as a charity in this space, um, you've got huge financial pressure. Um, and every single day, of, if we're delivering a model that we don't feel is, is um, impactful, then we're, we're going through reserves to employ staff to deliver that model. So we do have to make those decisions uh, almost daily at the moment. So um, yeah, the, the learning and really rapid iteration um, cycles is, is something we'll take forward. Um, another uh, big thing I think um, is, uh, through this period a light will very much be shone on the attainment gap um, and the increased and inevitable attainment gap between young people from um, disadvantaged backgrounds um, and how we can um, yeah put pressure on on DfE to to understand that there needs to not only be um, an acceptance of, of that of that gap um, when young people are, uh, arrive and our attempts to bridge it now but when they come back to school in September that there is also um, support for boosting the, that attainment if young people didn't have access to um, learning materials over this time and we, we already know that that gap very much exists so I think one of the things for us um, that is, has been really important is around this digital in engagement and how we can deliver um, projects and learning opportunities to young people in their homes and I think you know we've, we've just launched a, a kind of spoken word uh, project for young people by partnering with a rapper and, and sending out a kind of briefs for young people to do at home and, and learn in, in ways that we know um, won't take up massive masses of data and allow them to be creative and then they can have those phone calls with with their practitioners to be able to bridge that gap. I think another thing is the flexibility and the therapeutic approach um, to build the case for that I think particularly for therapeutic intervention for young people and um, avoiding kind of clinical settings that feel very unfamiliar is something we've we've always is really core cool to our model and we have practitioners in in football tracksuits with a ball at their feet who um yeah are trauma informed and work with young people to to work through the trauma that um they've unfortunately gone through and I think this period will be helping us build that case for um that being a need across across the sector and finally, two more things. Um, one, the, the importance of storytelling in all of this. Um, we, we launched a series of, of content called the Isolation Diaries. And um, we've got young people, teachers, uh, our staff and parents um, who are NHS workers recording at the same time every week. And we're doing some really beautiful storytelling across across society of um, what, what this is like for people and really bringing those kind of people together in, in a space that they, they may not have interacted before. So I think there is a, a cause for optimism there. And finally, um, really uh, building on the uh, willingness um, to give that, that we've seen in the football industry from, from our professionals with the Players Together campaign. Um, we partnered with the National Emergency Trust um, and uh, did a fundraising, fundraising campaign using our kind of connections in, in professional football and getting players to um, submit uh, some videos and stuff and really working, I guess, through this around how football as, a, as the kind of the national um, game and national love that, that we can yeah, bridge those divisions perhaps between the pro game and, and encourage more um, investment into communities um, and yeah, so a sense of social responsibility, which I think they've been um, incredible at showing so far. So yeah, that, I think that's, that's a, a cover quite a lot there, but uh, they're, they're the therapy, uh, flexible therapy, uh, storytelling, 
the bridging the gap between the program and football and, and also um, ensuring that um, we're having the conversation and putting things in place um, to bridge the kind of inevitable increasing attainment gap uh, for young people. Thank you so much for that. And it really does feel like we could keep you all day as witnesses with your experience and your background to really try and unpick some of this. But we are going to bring it to a close. We did say that we would do that at 12.30. So thank you ever so much to all of our witnesses, to Catherine, to Ceylon, to Naomi and to Robin. We really, really value your time this morning helping us shape this inquiry and establishing some of that best practice and sharing the great work that you're doing with our colleagues and local authorities across the country as well as central government. We split this session this morning just because we were mindful that it was going to be quite a big panel with lots of witnesses. So we are hearing some more evidence this afternoon in addition to the evidence that we took earlier this week. If you did want to make any further written submissions to this inquiry, you still certainly got time to do so. So please, uh, until the end of this week, share that with your, your colleagues and other organisations that you work with as well. We will be looking to turn around that report as soon as possible so that we can get that information out far and wide. Thank you to Jill and Peter as members uh, of the APPG this morning for their contributions and their uh, really important questions. And thank you to British Future once again as our Secretariat, uh, not least to Lucy, who's provided all of the briefings and the coordination and been in charge of the technology uh, this morning. So thank you, Lucy. Thank you all once again. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much.